class they're going to have a very special show and tell. If children that want to leave for uh, children's church can do so now. She told them that what she wanted them to do the next day was to bring in an object, a symbol that represented their faith. And a, a little boy went first. He said, I'm Jewish. This is a menorah. A little girl went next and she said, I'm Catholic and this is a rosary. And two other girls stood up next, uh, uh, each of them holding the end of a string of beautiful prayer flags and explained they were Buddhist. And, and uh, another boy unrolled his prayer flag and said, a uh, prayer rug rather, and said, I'm a Muslim. And then little Johnny reached into his backpack and he pulled out a Pyrex baking dish and said, I'm a United Methodist. <laughs> This is a casserole. Now that is an old, old church joke. And that may be something a lot of folks in United Methodist churches don't get. Because more and more United Methodist churches are having fewer and fewer shared meals. Depending on where you're from, they're called potlucks or pigeons or covered dish dinners. Um... I've noticed in my lifetime an interesting progression. When I was a child and then a, a teenager, there were some killer cooks in churches, and it was all homemade comfort food that came to those meals. Now when Barbara and I uh, came back to the churches as young adults, I noticed that folks were going to the grocery store deli but they were at least putting it in their own Tupperware containers. <laughs> and yet, when, when, it didn't take me long it, it, after I got into ministry that I noticed folks weren't even bothering to put it in their own containers. They were bringing it right with them. And it was still in the KFC bu bucket or, or uh, in the, you know, the, the grocery store deli container. And then that's further progressed to the point where a lot of churches just cater their meals. And because of the expense of that, they don't do it very often. Uh, and, and we kind of miss something uh, when we don't have that, that communal table fellowship. Uh, and, you go, and let's be honest, that's, I think, not just something that happens in the church, it happens in a lot of homes. More and more families have fewer and fewer times that the entire family is gathered around the table, sharing a meal and conversation. Uh, we have, we have. By the way, did you know we have a monthly community meals here at our church? Did you know that? No. Okay, I'm telling you because I didn't figure you did because I haven't seen very many of you uh, at those meals. Okay. Uh, and, and our next one's coming up. Uh, let me see. Pastor Deb gave me a note. I told her not to trust my memory. Uh, it's coming up on June 24th. Okay? You got time. Now you can get it on, you know, you can get out your smartphones now. I give you permission. Put the date <laughs> on your calendar. June 24th. It's actually going to be a, our Crossroads Farm. Okay? And we're going to have a blessing to the animals. Uh, that's actually a very ancient Christian tradition. What time is it? I think it starts at like 4.30 so when we start serving and we keep going for a while. Great. Okay? Um, and uh, so you know, we, we want you to come and bring your animals because we'll have a, a blessing in the animals. Uh, but I, you, you need to know it's a blessing in the animals. If you've got a demon dog, it ain't an exorcism. <laughs> okay? Um, and you know, the, those, those communal meals, those, those are great. Um, and, and the decline in them may be lamentable, uh, but, but eating together is really not one of the central tenets of our faith. Okay? Uh, Dr. Uh, Donald Haynes was a very well-respected writer for uh, 
The United Methodist Reporter, that used to be an actual newspaper you could hold in your hands. Now, like so many of them, you can find it online, but it's all digital content. And it's there, umr.com, I believe. Uh, but he, he once wrote, all other major religions begin with a good man. In Christianity alone, the salvation journey begins with a good God. The invulnerable evidence is that we are called to a relationship with God who in Jesus Christ showed himself a God of redeeming love. The God who is revealed in Jesus inseparably united the incarnation and the atonement. The God sent mission of the Bethlehem baby whose birth the angel announced as good news of great joy which shall be to all people is the same as the Savior of all humankind who died on the cross. As Isaac Watts, the great old hymn writer, wrote, did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown, sorrow and love flow mingled down. You may have heard some folks talk about God's plan of salvation. In fact, someone may have given you a, a nice little trap. They said, here it is. You go, you go ba-bing, 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 Satan. Right? Uh, we Wesleyans, however, use the phrase, the way of salvation. Because way implies a journey, a, a walk, a, a path, uh, rather than some checklist, right? Uh, or, or instruction manual. If you think about it, you think about plan. You know? It's like a blueprint or assembly instructions, right? Um, but God created us for relationship with Him. And relationships like husband-wife, parent-child, friend-friend, those don't have plans to be followed mechanically. As much as there are times that we wish they did, you know? There are times we wish we had a checklist, but they don't, do they? Relationships don't. Um, last week, I reminded us of the roles Jacob Arminius and John Calvin played, and they continue to play in Protestant Christianity. The great continuing debate between their spiritual and intellectual descendants is not how a sovereign God can love, but how a loving God can be omnipotent or have all power. For Calvinists, God shows and God proves His omnipotence or uh, uh, proves His sovereignty through His omnipotence or His power. Calvinists believe that every human being is so totally depraved and deserving of eternal hellfire and damnation that if justice is to be served, everybody goes to hell. Calvinists understand God exercises His sovereign power through elective grace. The elect get saved, the rest get what they deserve. Damnation. So we and millions of other Christ followers wrestle then with the deep, deep question, is God's nature inherently justice or inherently love? In one of his sermons, John Wesley defined the essential bottom line essence of Calvinism. He said, by virtue of an eternal, unchangeable, irresistible decree of God, one part of mankind are infallibly saved and the rest infallibly damned. It being impossible that any of the former should be damned or any of the latter should be saved. Now think about that. When I think about that, I, you know, if that's the case, I've wasted a lot of time and energy over the last 30 years preaching. And if you think about it, what are you doing here? Jerry Walls is a Wesley scholar and a professor at Asbury Seminary down in Kentucky. And, and, he, and he, he wrote that the, the Calvinist 
inherent justice nature of God position. He says that it doesn't do justice to the character of God revealed in Scripture. It does not accurately portray the Holy One who is compassionate and gracious. As Psalm 103 verse 8 says, slow to anger, abiding in love. The God for whom love is not merely an option, it's not merely an elective, but the God who is such that His eternal nature is to love. So the fundamental doctrine uh, for us Methodists is that, that God is inherently love. Now, are there accounts in the Holy Scriptures of God, uh, an angry God meeting out justice? Yes. Yeah. But think about it. Remember what I said, God created us for a relationship with Him. Now, I know some of you are farther along the path toward total sanctification than I am, but in my relationships with Barbara, with my daughters, with friends, with colleagues, there are times I've gotten angry. And occasionally they deserved it. That's what happens in relationships, doesn't it? But in my relationships, my relationships, limited and fallible as they are, love is the preeminent, the predominant, the prevailing nature of those relationships. And similarly, in the Holy Scriptures, we find there are many, many, many more references that teach us that God's inherent nature is love. Kurt, can you pull up the uh, Scripture from Jeremiah? Look at that. Jeremiah 31, Old Testament prophet. The Lord appeared to them from a distance. I have loved you with a love that lasts forever. And so with unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Psalm 145, verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all He has made. Pull up 2 Peter. Very good. The Lord isn't slow to keep His promise as some think of slowness. But He is patient toward you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. There are so many references in the New Testament that Jesus' atoning death on the cross is for all, for every man, for everyone, for the whole world. Our Gospel lesson. Can you find that, Kurt? Gospel lesson from John's Gospel. Jesus is talking to His disciples. He's, he's trying to get them ready for what's coming. He says, now is the time for judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler will be thrown out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. And when Jesus said that, of course, when He talks about being lifted up from the earth, that was clearly a reference to the, the act of crucifixion. Because the condemned was lifted up from the earth to hang there until they died. And then he says, I will draw everyone to me. Think about that. Exercises of power are sometimes obeyed. They are respected. But more out of fear for what may happen if we don't, right? As opposed to love attracts us. That's what Jesus says. I'm going to draw, when my, my loving sacrifice, I'm going to draw everyone to me. I'm going to attract everyone to me. I uh, told you last week that Charles Wesley, uh, John's brother, wrote a bunch of hymns. Great. Our best theology is often found in, in, uh, in Charles Wesley's hymns. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go old school. Pick up a copy of the hymn. It's that blue book that we, we don't very often use in this particular service, okay? But I want you to turn to number 386. 386. Okay? Now, first, I want to know how many of you recognize that? Have you ever sung that hymn before? 
think so. You know, at, at the first two services today, no hands went up, which is really kind of a shame, because this is this is a theologically sound and it's a powerful hymn. You see, what Charles is doing in this hymn is he starts out making reference to uh, a situation that was that's akin to Jacob wrestling with the angel, with God, and then goes from there to a revelation of God's nature. And, and, it, and it's got an old Scottish tune. I'm going to try to sing it for you, so, so hopefully I, I can uh, stay reasonably on pitch. And if you catch on, you're welcome to sing it with me, but you don't have to, okay? Come thou, O traveler unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before her is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay, and wrestle till the break of day. With thee all night I mean to stay, and wrestle with till the break of day. I need not tell thee who I am, my misery and sin declare. Thyself hast called me by my name. Look on thy hands and read it there. But who I ask thee, who art thou? Tell me thy name and Tell me now, but who I ask thee, who art thou? Tell me thy name and tell me now. Yield to me now, for I am weak, but confident in self-despair. Speak to my heart in blessing, speak, be conquered by my instant prayer. Speak, or thou never hand shall move, and tell me if thy name is love. Speak, or thou never hand shall move, and tell me if thy name is love. Tis love, tis love, thou diest for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Pure of universal love thou art. To me, to all thy mercies move, thy nature and thy name is love. To me, to all thy mercies move, thy nature and thy name is love. Charles Wesley got it. He knew God's name and nature. Is love. <coughs> love. Now, like our Calvinist brothers and sisters, we do believe in God's sovereignty. God's in charge. God's God. We're not. Um, the difference is that we believe that God chooses to express God's power much more through love than through power. And being created in the image of God. Remember what it says at the beginning of the Bible. Be male and female he created and in the image of God he created them. Right? We're, we're created in the image of God. You and I are endowed with human liberty. When love is so deeply rooted, so complete, that it sets the loved one free. Power is compromised. In our freedom, we can reject 
God's love. So love is risky. Love's vulnerable, isn't it? We certainly, many of us have experienced it on the, on the human scale. Think about it on the divine scale. In both human and divine relationships, when love is rejected, the one loving has to make a decision whether to keep on loving or stop. Human love is often conditional. I, if you love me, I will love you in return. We don't always express it that way, but that's kind of the way we, we often live it. You know, I'll, I'll give a little bit of love your way and I'll wait to see what comes back to me. And if it doesn't come back, then okay. Kind of like we, we've never gotten past, maybe they don't do this anymore with notes, maybe they do this now with text messages. We, we've never gotten past junior high school where you say, you know, go ask Susie if she likes me. And it's Huh? It's circle like, yes or no. It's circle yes or no. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Right. You know, and if you get the right answer, they say, I like you too, right? Yeah. But if not, oh well. No. Right. Human love is often conditional, but God's love is unconditional and never ending. I want to show you a classic painting. George, can we dim the lights up here so it can, it can be seen a little bit better? This is Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal, okay? The Return of the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt, okay? Uh, I don't, some of you, like me, may have had to take an art appreciation class sometime, and eyes glazed over, oh my gosh. <laughs> What's really cool about so many of these is there's so much more than we, that, that's there than we think we see. All right? Now, if we look at that painting, uh, for example, you've got the sulking older brother in the shadows, okay? And I, obviously, you see the loving father, okay? And then you see the prodigal son, and man, I mean, his, he's a wreck. You, know, you, look at, you look at those clothes, and uh, they're, they're just nasty, dirty, raggedy. In fact, his sandals are falling off. Uh, he's got all sorts of gunk and yuck on his on his foot there. His his hair's really short uh, because that's probably you know. I mean, he was living with the pigs, right? According to the account in the Bible. But what we probably didn't see before. Show him the next picture. If you look, look at the father's hands. If you look at that up close, you look at the left hand. That's a man's hand. It's strong. It's powerful. You can see the veins uh, and, and the tendons and you know, the, the, the big fingers. And then and you look at the right hand. That's a woman's hand. Caressing. Soft. Gentle. Together. Together. Those are the hands of God, the hands of a love that never lets go. God's love never lets us go. For us, salvation is not something like a courtroom where we have to stand in front of a judge and and, and, and we're either going to be found guilty and sentenced or we're going to be determined to be not guilty and, and set free. No. For us, the way of salvation, because God's inherent nature is love, the way of salvation is like a hospital where everybody who's sick is being treated for healing. And each of us, is somewhere in that process of being healed from those things that separate us from God. But they never separate us from God's love. We pray with you? Thank you, God, for re reminding us again and again that your very nature is love. First, it's love. 
in the middle it's love, at the end it's love. It's, it's all about your love. And if there's anyone here this morning or, or anyone who, who hears this later that does not, has not experienced how deeply you love them, I pray that your grace will just flood all over them and remind them Help them see and understand just how unlimited and unending your love for them is. And for those of us that are that are being healed, we pray for more grace that we might even more deeply experience your love. Let it sink deeper within us so that we might in turn share your love with others. We ask this. In Jesus' name, amen.